Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome to hell. We have such sights to show you. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Pin Cushion Demon Spawn, Pinhead, and the movie Hellraiser. I really enjoyed the first film, a body horror extravaganza based on a novella by Clive Barker called The Hellbound Heart. The film tells the story of a man who pursues a puzzle box called the Lament Configuration. Rumors say that one who manages to solve the puzzle and open the box will be able to experience pleasure beyond comprehension. However, the box summons creatures named Cenobites who cannot distinguish pleasure from pain. There is more to the story than that, but that is the main premise for the first film, which I recommend if you haven't seen it. I would say it's a horror classic, but with most well-liked horror films, a million cash grabs in the guise of a sequel were released, all varying degrees of bad. I landed myself on Hellraiser 5 Inferno because it had a more noir detective theme and hey, that's my jam, my YouTube expertise, if there was in fact such a thing. So I watched it and it was bonkers and now I will relay what I saw to you in comedic fashion. As the intro credits start rolling, we're shown the notorious Lament configuration and a wavy, smoky animated text that looks like it was done in iMovie. I also clocked the text that says based on characters created by Clive Barker, so I'm anticipating a very loose Hellraiser movie. We begin with a rousing game of chess at a basketball court because, you know, the loud gym is a prime setting for chess. I mean, the chess players are sweating just as much as the ball players, so there's that. Meet Detective Joseph Thorne, a dirty cop with a penchant for cocaine and groomed eyebrows. We get some introspection in the form of voiceover where he compares his life to a puzzle. The allegory is subtle, but it's there. But what I didn't know, what I never could have imagined, was that one day my own life would become the most challenging puzzle of all. <laughs> This dialogue is gonna be a treat. Hey, say you'd let a word for Slaughterhouse. This is Detective Tony, Joe's new partner, who I assume is working on a crossword puzzle, but he's not holding one, so I imagine he's just had this question in his head all day and busted it out at the crime scene. They arrive at a murder scene where someone has been obliterated in a room with a haphazard amount of candles. I understand this is all evidence, but should we really have all these lit candles at the crime scene? The victim is revealed to be Jay Cho, someone Joe knew from high school. Tony asks if they were friends, and Joe, in this sinister way, explains that he didn't have many friends, but he tried out for the basketball team at one point. He tortured the shit out of him until he quit. Seems like standard cop behavior to me. Zydrate comes in a little glass vial. Yeah, Joe pokes around a bookshelf and just happens to find more cocaine. Oh, he's also a magician. Great. Not insufferable at all. He stares intensely at a candle until he finds something. What do you got? It's a child's finger. Wait, what? That does not look like a child's finger. Look at the scale. Here's Joe's thumb. Here's the finger. It's a child's finger. There is just something hilarious about how this line was said. I'm not sure why. I can't put my finger on it. Just to show how corrupt this character is, he's immediately seen here stealing money from the evidence room and changing the documentation. He takes the puzzle box with him and heads home where we see he has a wife and kid. What is this weird angle? What is going on? Honey, I found your finger. His wife says hello, asks him how he is, and I tried to focus on this lethargic dialogue. I really did, but I got distracted by this amazing tea kettle. Fuck, that is cool. Hang on, we gotta hammer this corrupt cop character deeper into the coffin. We gotta show him cheating on his wife with a sex worker. Hang on, let me take off my glasses so I can see you better. I can't determine the mood of this scene, but what I do know is that the midi triangle is going wild. You know what would make this really sexy? Transitioning to a red screen. Yeah, there you go. After a lukewarm sex scene, Joe gets up and sits on the toilet. Booze goes in, poop comes out. He studies the puzzle box, and I swear to God, the music that starts playing sounds like a demonic version of the Jeopardy theme song. The puzzle box opens and the setting changes. He is transported into his childhood bedroom where everything is teal. He tries to leave and runs into a very well manicured Cenobite. Hi! Another one joins in and they put their hands inside his chest. It's weird and I'm not gonna show it here. He keeps hearing a little girl cry out for help and when he goes to find her, he runs into Chattering Teeth Cenobite, a staple for the Hellraiser movies. As he goes out the door, he runs into Pinhead. Up, who promptly tears open his face. Joseph wakes up on the floor next to the box. He writes everything off as a dream and goes to work the next day. You were right about Jay Cho. The uh, punctures and tears in the flesh, they were made by a hook or hooks with barbed ends. I am definitely a real doctor. Joe gets a call from Daphne, the sex worker he was with the previous night, and tells Joe she's still at the hotel and needs his help. I cannot tell if she's in trouble or if she's having the best climax of her life. Oh God! 
he rushes back to the hotel and promptly checks the shower. Good God. So much mildew. Joe goes back to Tony and tells him to go look in the bathroom. As he does, Joe takes this opportunity to take his cigarettes and pen. Tony is suspicious, asking Joe what he did to her, but he says he had nothing to do with it. He convinces sweet cinnamon roll Tony to clean up the place because he knows this doesn't look great for him. Tony reluctantly agrees, and while they're cleaning, Joe plants Tony's stuff near the bed for potential blackmail purposes. I know they cleaned, but isn't there a lot of DNA on the bed? They had sex in that thing. There's probably also a phone log of her call going to the station, but you know, who needs details in a murder mystery film? Another finger is found at the murder scene, and it's very squishy. No stiffness. Ooh, ASMR. Joseph asked the crime lab technician to change the fingerprint settings to someone who might have hooks in their establishment. So he says, look for a body piercer. And believe it or not, they find a body piercer's fingerprints on the puzzle box. Wow, detectiving is easy. The print leads us to stigmata body piercing. And boy, oh boy, did the writers try to make body piercing as shocking as possible. It is edgy and grimy. And this guy has a thorn tattoo, whips on his wall. How wonderfully stereotypical. Leon the piercer knew Jay Cho. He tells Joseph that he was going to sell the puzzle box to Jay, but he couldn't afford it, so he stole it. Leon goes on to say he was holding the box for someone else, someone that goes by the name The Engineer, and that he's just the middleman. How many times are they going to say engineer in this scene? You tell him the engineer wants his money or he wants his property back, and he'd still be better off dealing with me than with the engineer. Why don't you tell me about the engineer, Leon? Holding up for the engineer? There's no way I'm gonna talk to you about the engineer. Hunt for the engineer. And the engineer will hunt you. Also, when I think about threatening monikers, the engineer doesn't really come to mind. Now I'm imagining being hunted down by a computer engineer. Well, this is a lot. Let's take a quick ad break because if you think I watched and did a video on this thing for free, you'd be wrong. We'll continue Joseph's story in just a few seconds. Joe stops by his drug dealer and years-long snitch to stock up on cocaine. His name is Bernie and he's a creepy ice cream truck man. Great! Joseph beats him to tell him more about the engineer, and I'm going to try to briefly reiterate what is said here, but the dialogue and writing is so haphazard, it's really hard to understand. You go downtown, Bernie. You pound your van, explain your daily activities. You remember the last time. Okay, okay, shit! Okay. Bernie tells Joe a story about a man named Terry who fell in love with one of the women the engineer, quote, loans out. Terry and this woman run away together. The engineer finds out, kidnaps the woman back, and starts sending him back pieces of her hair and clothing as warnings. Eventually, Terry finds her in his bed. However, it isn't all her. Told you you shouldn't have asked about the green ribbon. Tony feels guilty about wiping off all the prints at the motel for Joseph and says they should come clean. He believes that Joe did not kill the girl. He just wants to do the right thing. Joseph asks him where his pen and cigarettes are, then says they're probably at the crime lab. Using the planted evidence as leverage, he tells Tony that if he does not keep his secret, he will tell the chief it was him who was with the girl and that it was his idea to clean up the scene. Tony, being new at the precinct, is angry and deflated and leaves. Suddenly, a random child enters the bar and gives Joseph a VHS tape. He decides to use the bar's TV to play the tape because who cares what's on it? Let's just show the entire public. On the tape, we see and hear someone in the ice cream truck getting beaten with the Cat 9 hooks, the same weapon that was at the piercing shop. We then see another dismembered finger held by a Cenobite. We also see Bernie slumped over the steering wheel. When Joseph tries to show the tape to the guys down at the precinct, nothing is on it. The chief is concerned that Joseph might be feeling stressed considering he knew some of the victims and tells him he's required to make an appointment with the department's therapist if he wants to keep working on the case. Because we have no sense of time in this movie, the very next scene is him at the therapist. No idea how much time has passed, he's just there. James Remar, as Steven Spielberg, as the therapist, begins to talk to Joseph, clocking the stress balls he carries around. He does a little trick for the doctor, and he responds with, I bet your daughter loves that. I just mostly used to entertain myself. Oh, masturbatory magic, that's a new one. Joseph clearly gives no shits about these victims. They're corrupted, degenerate scum to him. His main concern is finding the child with the missing fingers, who, according to forensics, is still alive. As he's working, he sees another Cenobite pass by the office. <laughs> Bernie is found, just like Joseph described, which is beginning to look extremely suspicious since no one else saw the tape. They listen to a voice message from Terry to Bernie and get a lead on where to go. Oh my god, this shaky cam is driving me nuts. 
nuts. Who did this? I'm getting some serious Twin Peaks vibes from this setting. Except for when you go in, it's just the cowboy hat club. Excuse me, I'm looking for a cliche. Anyone? seen any cliches? He finds a man named Mr. Parmaji, who I call Mr. Parmesan, and with cool intention asks, Are you the engineer? You flatter me, sir. These dialogues are exhausting. They're really slow paced and monotone. He wants you to play the game. You think this is a goddamn game? Uh, yes? He just told you it was a game. Get it together, detective. As he starts chasing someone through the woods, he sees Cenobites scattered amongst the trees. Someone approaches, and it's ZZ Top! <laughs> he then promptly gets his ass kicked by a couple cowboys. Instead of going to the hospital, Joseph demands Tony take him back to the precinct so he can talk to the therapist. They have an impromptu therapy session, Joseph gets salty, and Dr. Gregory admits that one of his former patients also became obsessed with somebody named the Engineer. Because client confidentiality doesn't exist, exist in this universe, Dr. Gregory tells Joseph all about him, his delusions, paranoia, and fixation with the engineer. He became so distressed that he shot himself in his office. Cool. He also knows a lot about the history of the Lament configuration. They say it's a window, or a gateway. Well, you know when God closes a window, he opens a gateway to hell. I live in a world of facts. Oh my god, this noir monologuing is giving me a stroke. He goes home to check on his little girl, and his wife notices he's pretty beaten up. As she begins to clean him up, he reaches out to touch her face, but his hand is a demon hand! Ah. They get a call from his mom, who is in the hospital, and his wife says she got a visitor who, quote, might be an engineer. Joseph springs up and cheeses it, running right past his crying child. The movie definitely starts to pick up around this point. We see Joseph barreling down this hallway, that's twisting and distorted, passing creepy looking characters on the way to his mom's room. When he gets there, his dad is in the hospital bed and his mom is knitting in a rocking chair, asking him why he never visits them. He hears a child scream and busts through the next door, once again revealing his childhood bedroom and some off-putting teal lighting. The door locks behind him and he can hear his mom screaming on the other side of the door. In a much less comedic Groundhog Day-like scene, Joseph wakes up in his bed and relives the previous convo he had with his wife. Back to the hospital! Except this time his parents are missing, vanished, like from one of your magic tricks, Joseph. When they examine his dad's bed, it's full of blood. Big yikes. There's a present for him on the bedside table, a gift of two fingers and a note that leads him in the next direction. Tony shows up yet again and tells Joe he's out of control, that there is no engineer, there's no connection, and that he is the one that knew all of the victims. Tony insists he needs help. Go to hell. Okay, movie. Little bit too on the nose. Joseph goes to the address that was on the note and finds nothing of interest, and it becomes painfully apparent that this movie is bad at building suspense. He finally comes across a telescope. As he looks through it, he sees Tony get murdered by a Cenobite. The Cenobite is like, look what I got, nya nya. He gets a call from the engineer himself, the man, the myth. He tells Joseph to go home. Oh no, that's not supposed to be here. Welcome home, detective. This seems like very unethical treatment, Doctor. Joseph tries to hold his daughter's hand and this happens! Ooh, ick. After that, his wife and child break apart like porcelain and disappear. Joseph lets out a scream. The therapist tells Joseph that he ran fingerprints on one of the fingers they found and miraculously, they found a match. The child's fingerprint. Well, it's yours. Dun dun dun. Dr. Gregory tells him that his file is almost complete. Joseph asks if he's the engineer. No, you donut. There's no engineer. There's only Pinhead. <laughs> I don't know why that line is cracking me up so much. Let's take another quick break, and when we return, we'll discuss the thrilling conclusion of Hellraiser 5 Inferno. <laughs> Pinhead stares at Joseph with his big, vacuous eyes and tells him to go home, meaning his childhood home. He follows Pinhead through some saloon doors and there he is again, his childhood bedroom. He sees his younger self and follows him around with a fucking shotgun, which seems weird, but Joseph seems to be going through some stuff. He enters the kitchen where he sees his mom serving his young apparition brownies. The entire room starts shaking and it's very internal sunshine of the spotless mind. 
but bad. His mom ages and starts haphazardly swinging a knife at him while his dad outright attacks him. Oh good, the shaky cam is back. I was just thinking about how much I missed that nauseating sensation from when they did it last time. He's basically going through the house and confronting all of the victims he was involved with. They each try to attack him, but Joseph successfully fends them off. The entire last part of this movie is pretty good. The pacing and tone feels really off and boring for the longest time, then it gets fairly interesting with Joseph fighting his quote, demons as it were. Yo, this is a story all about how. He is confronted once more with his young self who is missing fingers. A Cenobite approaches him and reveals him to be... Joseph. There are a lot of Josephs in this room. I don't understand. Yeah, that makes both of us. Pinhead tells him he hurt many people and thus forged these chains. And Joseph is like, I, just, you know, I don't know. This is the hell you have created for yourself. I will not be showing some of the end because it's pretty graphic, but it involves being ripped apart by chains. Joseph briefly wakes up thinking he just had a nightmare, but quickly finds out that what he experienced is looping. And this is his eternal hell. Well, what can I say that I haven't already? I thought this movie was kind of a disaster. Everyone is chewing the scenery, the stereotypes are on full display, and there are times I can't tell if the movie is being sloppy or doing something weird on purpose. It's not a good enough film to distinguish between the two. It's also a prime example of telling instead of showing. The first Hellraiser did a fantastic job of showing us what the story was about. Subsequent Hellraisers seem to lay things on pretty thick with a lot of explanatory dialogue, and I'm not always against that, in a film or story, sometimes more exposition can clarify parts of the plot, but this was pretty bad. I also couldn't believe how few fucks I gave about any of these characters, especially the lead. Strangely, I did have an appreciation for Craig Sheffer's over-the-top acting and these dramatic mugs he pulled throughout the film that would work well in a hard-boiled cop movie, except this was mashed with a horror movie and the film never really found a good balance for me. I will say that I did like some of the eerie atmospheres, especially towards the end of the movie, but most of the time, things happen with very little payoff. And like the majority of Hellraiser sequels, Pinhead himself seems to be an afterthought. My biggest grievance with this film is the story. The continual references to innocence lost, forging the chains you wear in life, and creating your own personal hell are predictable and trite. It's also more padded than my push-up bra, full of side stories and characters that don't go anywhere. The cowboy club, the talk about the engineer, it all just seems shoehorned in for the sake of extra story. The engineer stuff, though I'm sure is meant to be more symbolic than anything, another part of Joseph's personal hell, is honestly a bunch of nothing that I didn't care one iota for. That being said, after watching all 10 Hellraiser movies, this one isn't the worst. It at least adheres to the themes and we get to see Cenobites fairly often, but not being the worst isn't exactly a glowing review. Nobody wants to be called mediocre at best. If you have any thoughts on this movie or the series as a whole, please leave a comment. I would absolutely love to hear all of your burning hot pinhead takes. Until next time, stay spooky. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Hellraiser 5 Inferno. If you want more content from me, I have a lot on offer, but first I want to thank my wonderful patrons for supporting me with cold hard cash that I spend on new socks. If you want to support the channel, please consider joining my campaign for a few bucks, and if not, comments and likes are also appreciated. If you want to see more from me, here's a few suggestions. On the right, we have the last video I did on a vampiric episode of Murder, She Wrote, and on the left, I have a short but sweet review on an adventure game I recently played and loved. Thanks again for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next one.